disease, which primarily actually measures, give a weight to each galaxy in the probability of which you've seen a galaxy, which is the volume of which it could be seen. So actually you sum up the contribution to luminosity function by the contribution of all the galaxies by saying over which volume it could have been seen. So in one sense, a galaxy which has been seen over a large volume, in one sense comes in with a lower weight because you have a large probability of seeing it, whereas if you have a seen it over a small volume only, then you have a, a larger weight coming in there. So this is the, the maximum volume of which you can see it. Then, so, and then there's the other met methods to estimate them, is uh, maximum likelihood methods coming out uh, and so on, and then, you know, break, break, primarily STY and SWML, which is the stepwise maximum likelihood method. It's the, it assumes a bin luminosity function, and the STY assumes a functional form, which is the Schechter function to some level. And the thing is, in those cases, is that the probability of a galaxy of having a luminosity L in a volume of element dx centered on x is simply given by this relation here. This is the probability, the, the, the luminosity element, the volume element. And you, you assume, actually, that you can separate these two terms by saying that, actually, it only depends on the luminosity function and, and then the density in, in that position. So you actually assume in these estimators that the luminosity function doesn't depend on the environment, which we know is intrinsically wrong. So it's actually quite nice. We always use these estimators, and they are intrinsically wrong from the starting point. But that doesn't, that's not too worrying as long as you know how to use them. Yeah? And you can actually use them in different ways, but it's uh, something fundamental here in these splits. And then actually, you actually measure the conditional probability of a galaxy of redshift uh, uh, at re uh, galaxy alpha at redshift z um, will have luminosity at alpha given by this probability here. You know, this is simply the probability of seeing it. So it's the, the, the luminosity function of having it, and then you actually ask you what is the probability of having seen it at that luminosity? What is the number of objects you have in there? That's kind of like how this probability comes up, and the likelihood is simply the product of all these probabilities. And that's it. You, you're happy you can go going. Now, what I haven't told you about is all the nasty stuff coming in. Because luminosity is not actually what we measure. Minimum luminosity, what is that minimum luminosity? Usually depends on something called K corrections. It's something you don't want to go into, but you have to deal with when you're dealing with uh, observational uh, astronomy. And, and all the evolutionary terms and so on. So that's in, it's in principle very simple, but it's in the details the, the, the problem comes in. Now, you can actually do a maximum likelihood estimator with, with joint density luminosity estimates, which Cole 2011 pro, uh, provided out and loved it all 2015, which gives you this relation. It's a bit more complicated, but this allows you to some level to, uh, to, to, to work with a, um, a, a density uh, uh, variation and so on. And in one sense here, the delta here is the galaxy over density at redshift alpha. And, but this equation here, the way it's been written up, it assumes no evolution of the luminosity function as well, and still doesn't explicitly write out what the luminosity function is for different environments. It actually assumes the same shape, but not the same normalizations. So it is, yeah? Is it assumed that a luminosity of a galaxy is the same of another, uh, uh, some redshift is the same of another galaxy at the same redshift? No, so what's assumed here is, do you know to make this estimate? Is actually that you, you observe a galaxy and you say that this is its luminosity at redshift. What you need to know is, what is its luminosity over the volume you can be seeing it? So it can, you either assume that luminosity is the same, you can move it back and forward, it means it hasn't evolved, which at zero thought is fine if you have a very narrow redshift land range. But it's not even accurate to that level because you need to account for the fact that you have band shifting. The photons emitted from a galaxy at redshift Z, and if you move the galaxy slightly differently, will now come into a different band in your observing it. So you need to account for that in the K corrections. So that K correction you usually assume, but the K correction depends on the SED of the whole galaxy. So it means that there's still full spectral energy distribution of the galaxy. And that to some level, you only know what the, that is at the redshift you observe it, not at another redshift. But you can make some reasonable assumption of how it should evolve. You know. So at, it's all of these small details how they come in, uh, and, and so on. So, so that's why I mean like the key ingredient for all estimators is kind of cosmology. The K correction is an SED-dependent correction to account for band shifting with redshift. 
and the e-corrections, the evolutionary correction to account for the fact that galaxies evolve. Now, in some cases you think that it doesn't really matter, the evolution, but actually you would be surprised that the evolutionary correction can depend, can be very important to account for if you do statistical analysis of your sample, because you're actually worrying about the small changes, they are, all, they are systematic changes, so therefore your measurement will be systematically affected by it, and, and, and so on. So just, just to give an idea of, of the, these, these measures, but from an observational point of view, you don't want to do that, because you want to measure what it really is. So an observer, ideally, should take the data in the scenario's possible redshift range, and you measure it, and that's it. But you're limited by the data sometimes, and so on. So these are the terms to, to think about and, and be concerned about. And then you can do this game of measuring luminosity function in different bands. And usually you have plot the luminosity function like this as a Schechter function. It comes out pretty well as a Schechter function. And here's the, the bright end and the faint end uh, uh, luminosity function. And you can see these plots reversed equally much on both sides if they go down you know, or, or, or down this way. But it, the whole point is, there's, this is the, the bright galaxies, your few bright galaxies in the universe, and, the, and many more faint objects. And these for different bands. Yeah. And there's different comparison here in this plot. The, nice, the reason I choose this, this plot here is because it actually provides you the luminosity function for galaxies in loads of different bands, from the far UV to optical blue G and I, G and R, G, uh, U and G, the R and I bands, near infrared J and H bands from the same data set. Now that is something very powerful when you want to understand galaxy evolution, galaxy formation, because actually using the same objects and so on. To give you an idea of these luminosity functions, again, this is the histogram at the bottom, and this histogram, the, the, the full histogram tells you about the number of objects you have actually observed. Yeah? So you have observed much more of these, these objects here, which are slightly fainter, but this distribution doesn't look like this function here, because this is how you can account for selection effects. This one has a selection effect, include, uh, has, depends on selection effect. This should have all the selection effect that accounted for. This other shaded histogram tells you about the contribution to the luminosity density. What is the total light in the, in, in that, in coming from that population? Yeah. And it's, wh why that is relevant? is actually because you like to know how much light has been, uh, have been emitted in total. What is the total amount of light per unit volume? And what you see here is the fact that it's again the L star, the typical galaxies, which contribute most. It doesn't matter that you have many more faint galaxies because they don't really contribute that much because they are many more, but they're so much fainter. So they are not contributing to total luminosity density. So, so that's kind of like the luminosity function now, in order to do these ones, there was a lot of work on the selection effects, which I will spare you about. But one of the things to bear in mind is, actually, in the end, you have to do all the tests you can do with the different data, different me measurements, and different sets, and see how well you are. And I haven't defined which, actually, how the magnitude have been defined in this, in this work, but I, I leave that to another, another time. But it's, it's consistent magnitude throughout this work, which, which is good in that respect. Now, what is this magnitude definition? What does it matter? I gave you yesterday a, little, a bit of a rant about all these magnitudes which exist. This is why it matters. Here are four different ways, model, Sersic, uh, Sersic exponential, uh, protrusion magnitudes, using the same data set, but plotted the luminosity function of the same data set. You can see the points in R. Now, this is the bright end. How this bright end is affected by which magnitude you're choosing. It's the same objects. It's just the way you have classified them. It's just the way you have characterized them, and so on. So if you, as a, from a theory point of view, you want to compare, you can start, oh, well, my model maybe matches this one, or should it match this one? What should it match? You need to think about that level in a, in, in the from the observations point of view, how to take it. Because in your model, you tend to predict total luminosities, not observed magnitude or observed luminosities in these bands. And these will depend, therefore, strongly on the, density pro on the luminosity profiles of your galaxies. You know? And that's why they will end up with different results. Now, so that's one thing. So I have to, at first, I saw the luminosity function is great. It's really easy to use. And this is the problem. 
Don't worry, there's more problems coming. I like problems. Problems are there to be overcome. Or also, they are there to be aware of, and then you can carry on happily, as long as you're aware of the limitations. So we looked at, so just give you an example, a stellar mass function. We show, uh, uh, Aldo showed this plot yesterday about a stellar mass function from the gamma survey. And, you know, this, he mentioned this double schechter Paolo uh, 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 function. And I thought it would be nice to see what, where does it come from. And actually, if you split the sample up into red and blue galaxies, you realize that your stellar mass function is very different, you know. And it's pretty much, there's a red population have one stellar mass function, and the blue population has another one. Yeah. So there is some intrinsic quantities there which are relevant. So if you have a model which does this very well, actually, you really want to make sure that it does this. Because this is what the population is really doing. It's not just any object can go anywhere. Meaning, splitting up your sample needs to be consistent. So this is where it becomes, the data is now that, that you can do this capacity of splitting it up. So actually understanding where it comes from, uh, and so on. Now, this is just a measurement of stellar mass function. Now, is the stellar mass function observed or inferred? Yeah. So first one, from a theoretical viewpoint, stellar mass function is the most fundamental characteristic of your, your, of your galaxy sample. Uh, in simulation, it's easy to derive. Easy, I put it in quotation marks, because I, if you really do hydrodynamic simulation, you realize it's actually more, a bit more complicated than that, and so on. But you just need to add up to some level the stars in a galaxy. That is what is your stellar mass function, meaning you have an object called galaxy, you add up the stars. You might want to worry about how you define a galaxy. But that's another issue. I'll leave that for the one who worries about that. You should worry about it, by the way. Um, because it might not be the same as the observer's definitions. From an observation standpoint, the stellar function is not an observable. The observer, when we observe, we collect flux. We collect photons, not stellar mass. So we need to go from photons to stellar mass in some way. The assumptions include, and they are non-exhaustive, initial mass function. As soon as you see that one coming in, the first thing you think about, oh no. Because nobody agrees on what it should be. So it's fine, you can choose something, but it might not be consistent with other people's, you know. So there's a, there's a whole literature of things. Stellar population simplest models. You know, what type of models have you actually created to get your, going from, to, to create your stars? In one sense, Brussels, Charlotte, Marston, this is also a variety of models that exist and gives you different predictions and different, you know, they are agree more or less with data available and so on. The stellar mass to light ratio, yes, which is measured in some band defined in some way. Yeah, because the light is light, means that you have a band and your band has been defined in some way because you have some magnitude or some luminosities and so on. Then you have something you need to think about, dust modeling and metallicity. Unfortunately, galaxies have dust. Some wavelengths are more obscure than others. The orientation of your galaxy will have an implication on that. Now, the stellar mass of the object is intrinsic. It is what it is. The luminosity of the object, to some level, is actually telling you, I've seen this object, had this luminosity, because that's a fault. It's not the intrinsic, not the dust corrected luminosities. So when I show luminosity function before, they're not being corrected for dust in that respect. You can try to do that, but it's very hard, because that means you need to do some radiative transfer models and so on. So this could possibly lead to misunderstandings on the accuracy. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's literature on this. I've given two papers on this example. But stellar mass functions, even though they're great, they are highly sensitive to the assumptions being used. Yeah. So I need to bear that in mind when using them. And then it comes the issue of do you manage to get stellar mass function across redshifts? And that's a whole different story, because then you start worrying about these things with time uh, and so on. So it's, it is a hard job, even though this is a more fundamental property. So the, the, the whole debate is, where should you go? Should you go from the theory to where's the observations, or should the observations go towards where is the, where's the stopping point? Where should it be? And I think both groups disagree on where they should meet. So it's, it's, um, it's a non-trivial thing. Anyway, let's go over to something more uh, simple and more fun. Cluster statistics, because they're, you know, statistics, they, they just tell you what it is, is, is nice. The two-point correlation function is, is pretty straightforward, because that's an order, another quantity you would use to characterize your galaxy sample. Yeah, 
So we can follow pebbles in that sense and defining two-point correlation uh, function, xi of s, is given by the excess probability of finding galaxy within the volume uh, dv at the position x from another galaxy, which is simply this relation here, where ng is the average galaxy number density. That's pretty forward. You use the cosmological principle, which helps you because that one tells you that xi will only depend on the separations as opposed to actual uh, position in 3D space. And when you're working with surveys, you need some estimator for this. And tip common correlation from estimators is like of the order, like DD over uh, DR or DD over uh, DR squared. I think I missed uh, minus one on this one. Yes, I missed the minus one. So I will tell you, yes, yeah, so there is a, a, a minus one missing here. But DD is the pairs of, uh, of uh, is the data data pairs at a given separation. RR is the uh, number of random random pairs. And the DR is the number of data random pairs at that separation. Now, what you need to, to remember is why do we need the randoms in one sense? In simulation, you don't need randoms. You just need to count up the, the data. It is because you know what the mean density is at any position. And your simulation is, has periodic boundary conditions, which means that the probability of finding a pair around any galaxy, or a, a neighbor around any galaxy, is in one sense symmetric. There's no edges. In a real survey, you have survey boundaries, which means that an object at the boundary of the survey, I can just plot it here quite easily, it's quite straightforward. You have an, if the object is here, clearly you can't find any pairs at, if you look at pairs at this separation, you won't find any pairs here because you haven't surveyed it. You just need to account for it. It's a selection function. Nothing complicated with that. But it means that you need to work a bit harder to actually make the estimator, estimate. But it's not, not that difficult. Okay. Um, I actually thought it was kind of funny. This is actually an equation I took from my thesis. So I realized somebody, nobody read my thesis. That's good. Uh, <laughs> Dark matter correlation function is spherically averaged, and uh, the, um, the correlation function is the basic one you do. And here's two examples dark matter correlation functions. So, what you actually do here is simply looking at what it is in real space, the correlation function, and in redshift space, where you have actually accounted for the peculiar velocities along uh, uh, one axis. Yeah, because when you observe the uh, galaxies, you actually don't get the true, you get the redshift, which includes the peculiar velocities along the line of sight. And this is what you actually tend to write observationally this way. Z, the, the, the true redshift is the Hubble full redshift plus the velocity component along that axis. Now, uh, if you do a 2D uh, uh, creation function, which tend to be what you tend to call xi rp pi diagram, it looks more like this. So this is where I've taken the, the data because I think it's a nice little, little uh, picture in this way. It's what you have here is a projected separation on the sky and it's the line of sight uh, separation of object. And what you see here is actually that you have the correlation function is not uh, uh, isotropic but it's anisotropic. And you have a much higher, you have a correlation function which is uh, uh, um, Decreasing with scale, but decreases in different uh, uh, rates, whether you are along the line of sight or whether you are a perpendicular line of sight. And <clears throat> here, over top, so the underlying uh, color diagram is actually real data from 2 df galaxy redshift surveys. Uh, and, um, and then on top of that is a model of the, the Kaiser, standard Kaiser model with finger gods uh, added on top in, 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 in the middle to actually model it. So, with this is a way of actually doing rich space distortions because you actually see the large scale infall. This is what, why it's you know, compressed in large scales, a large scale infall, and that gives you information about the growth rate uh, of the universe. So that's kind of like a very popular uh, way of actually going after cosmological uh, terms. But I don't think this is the best way forward because it's actually very hard to do the, the modeling in this uh, uh, RPP diagram. Now, one thing you can do, which is actually which is a common statistic, is actually stand, the problem with this is that depends on these velocity distributions. Now, it's very hard to do that, the modeling, and therefore, and if you want to go to a quantity which is simple, you can decide just to integrate along the line of sight here. Yeah? So if you do the integral along the sight, you actually get what, you, what ten, people tend to call the projected, galax uh, the projected uh, galaxy creation function, um, and which is much more of a power law in this sense, but still has some features in it. And this is the equation for this relation, 
meaning your predicate correlation function is the integral over zero to some maximum pi direction of the two point uh, uh, two dimensional correlation function. Now the projected correlation function WPRP is in is a statistic that provides in principle, I say in principle, a rigid space distortion independent result. Now it's not exactly providing a rigid space distortion independent result for various reasons. First of all, it's only rigid space independent if you actually integrate it out to infinity. You need to account for all the pairs along the line of sight. Yeah. Then the other thing, it's only providing you this if you are in a plane parallel approximation, meaning that all your line of sights are perfectly parallel with each other. Yes? So this, this is, this is, this, in this case, it's a simulation, but I can do the same on, on, simulation, on, on observations by just doing, taking this quantity here, meaning psi pi in each, in each box, and you just do the integral along the line of sight according to this relation here. Okay, no. So it's just uh, you can make this plot here is for dark matter correlation function. I can do the same similar plot for a galaxy correlation function. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But I can't go this one here and and this one here. If I want to do the two, I need to worry about bias, nonlinearities, and yeah. No, no, no. That's much more complicated. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, it was it was just the reason I took this one is because it's a nice picture. It's only a really nice picture and has been really been very popular. If you look for rich space distortions, is this picture you find most of the time. And I think John Peacocks would be quite happy to, to know that I used it as well. Um, uh, and on top of that, um, I think he got, he, he, that was one of the works which actually got awarded the um, Shaw Prize a couple of years ago. Uh, so that's why it's quite, quite nice to actually show. Um, anyway, yes. Yes? Yeah. So the bigger the distance is, the, the bigger the uncertainty is. I was expecting the other way. Here? Yeah, right. Okay, so there's two things. I, I, I'm going to come into this one. There's, there's two things coming in here. So it's, it's related to this issue. Is it the RST independent results? There's two points. So first of all, they have this pi max value. So if you don't integrate far enough, you're actually going to, because it's only pure, you can show analytically, it is a real space quantity if you integrate to infinity. Yeah? Because there is a perfect correspondence. Yeah. And if you don't integrate to infinity, there's a term going from pi max to infinity that you have missed. Where is that term contributing? That term contributes on larger scales, more. Because, and you can actually see it to some level here, if I assume I chop the information here yeah, at 20 megaparsecs, and I do the integral here, this part here is so high in amplitude, so actually what I'm missing on the fraction of all this, even though it's a signal out here, is a small fraction of this total signal. Whereas when I'm out here, I'm turning my parsecs, I'm actually integrating something which is rather flat, which has a long contribution as well. So one says, fractionally, it depends on scale. And this is why this comes in as a trend which is different on, on different scales. How far you integrate it, yeah. But again, this high function, you're using the estimators for Yes. And are you using the same kind of estimator for the uh, moving perpendicular line of sight? So it's, it's, this, it's the same estimator. I actually just use pairs um, on, I just measure my pairs, go back to my estimator here, this one here, let's say the Landisala estimator because this one is correctly written. Um, I just estimate this, but in terms of uh, Perpendicular on the line of sight and perpendicular to line of sight. Yeah, I just put all the pairs down in, in two bins as opposed to putting down them in just in separation. So it is the estimator is fine in this way. Yeah, and, and, and it, you can show these estimators are, re are really good. There, there are no problem in that sense. Uh, and, and, and that's also, there's some normalization factor which you, I can word into DD being suitably normalized. Yeah which is just an easier way to me to not worry about how normalization goes into it. But there is a normalization coming in here. And the neat, neat part is, if you add this minus one term here, which is here, it really bugs me not having it, is that you have two estimators. They have different properties on terms of if you do the mean, ins, mean estimate of the density, the den, you make an error in the estimate of the mean density. 
that means that the estimators will actually start to disagree because you have an uncertainty you haven't understood. So actually using two estimators is actually a really good way of checking your systematics again. And when calculating this one, you actually need to DD the DRs and the RRs. All these terms are here. Hard part of counting pairs is done. So you just need to combine them in different ways to show that you actually they are, they are equivalent. So this is the nice thing as well. Um, but coming back to this one here, there's another factor coming in, and this is where estimator matters. And people don't think so much about this, is this integral is, is nice. It's, I can always write it like this. What happens if I have noise in Xi of X, when I, in this Xi, when I integrate it? And if I have different level of noise in different situations, actually, because I might not have done my binning right or worried enough about the binning, that will lead to errors as well, which can be systematically underestimating your results as well. Because the noise is just not contributing in, a, in one sense. It doesn't cancel itself out, the contributions. So that's another factor coming into these error bars where they differ as well, to some level. Because on larger scales, you will have more noise. And the only way to beat down the noise is, in to, is a way to increase your randoms. Because that's the only thing you can do. Ring, yeah, the number of randoms you can increase as much as you want. The more randoms you have, the less noise you have in these terms. Here, in these terms, RRs or NDRs. But you're still limited to the data you have. Yeah. So it's, 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 um, it's something which is not, you know, we need to be careful about when using it. Yep? How do you count the internal uh, movement of, of galaxies uh, near the center of the collapse? So that's, that's actually already, in one sense, I don't account for it. If I want to interpret the results, I would need to account for it. But this is where the product correlation function is good, because the internal movements of galaxies and clusters yeah. is what causes this finger of God. Right. Yeah? But because I integrate along the line of sight, I actually, actually, average. Average, no, I don't even average, it's actually, I marginalize over that, that contribution. If you think about pairs in this plane parallel approximation, a pair which is at a given separation here oh, sorry, yeah. has to be somewhere along this axis yeah. in a plane parallel. You just have to move around. So if I integrate over it, I haven't lost it. It just so that's the whole point of how this project correlation function works. So um, yeah. So then you come into the state here, you have a real, real service and so on, and this is what you would do for galaxy service. This is from Sahara et al. for SDSS, you know, on these scales, looking at galaxies of different population, of different luminosities. This is luminosity, luminosity samples, and this is threshold samples. You can see that the clustering varies for different samples of different galaxies and so on, and, 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 and that's, that's important to have a, have a control over. And then you have the error bars, and that's something which actually is quite hard to estimate accurately, but there's, there's methods, and I'm just going to briefly bring that up on this, on this part. The error on clustering statistics, yeah, and there's what I call these two methods, either you do internal or external. Internal, what I mean, that is data driven. You take your data and you, you work with your data to some extent to actually get estimate of your errors. Yeah, and there's two ways, there's, well, like two main ways, bootstrap and jackknife, yeah, and basically is bootstrap is that you create what I would call in jackknife, whoops, you create, here's a footprint of SDSS, you create regions of your survey. This is one which have, I think, 25, and this probably has 100 sub-regions. You create these ones, and now you resample them in, in a given way. So bootstrap, just resample with replacement, these regions. And you calculate, you create a new sample, and you calculate your correlation function with that. With jackknife, you do this, the, the, the principle of use all of the regions except one, and you remove one in turn, all the time, and you get, that gives you an estimate of some of the variance. Yeah? And these kind of quilts are quite nice to visually represent what you're doing. The one thing which is not sad is, how do I define the size of these regions? And, and, and so on. Okay. Yes? Well, if you use bootstrapping, aren't you populating like, the same data over and over again, and then you know you're not doing things in the statistical so if you do bootstrap, so this is the whole th problem with the bootstrap, 
and so on, is that I can decide, I could create the crazy realization of just having this patch. You know, it's a rare realization, but because I've just sampled, and let's say I have 25, I need to do 25 draws with replacement, I could end up with just having this patch. Now, what that will cause you is not going to cause you a, a, a bias, but it cause you an increase in the errors. And that is what the booster method doesn't tell you, is how many times you need to replace things. It's a limitation in the methods. So you can actually do that test, actually, and, 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 and I'll, 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 I can show results of that if you want to. But the problem is that the, basically it works, these two methods, but the general point is number of subvolume is not defined. Yeah? And, and with jackknife, you have n samples, you have at most n realizations. Yeah? Because you have n subregions. That's what you So at some level, you're always going to be very quick limited to make, make a covariance matrix. With bootstrap, the number of replacement is not defined, but often assumed to be the same number of subvolumes. So in the case of my example of 25 regions I have here, yeah, I would just say, you know, I would try to draw 25 samples from this map here, and I might use two times this one, one times this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, four times this one, you know, that's a realization of it. Who told me in the bootstrap that I should use 25? It's not written anywhere that you should use exactly that number. That's not part of the, the scheme. And actually, when you do this statistic, you realize on clustering that actually using the same number is not right. And the reason you can come down to this is the fact that typically, the survey volume you're actually going to use is significantly smaller than the overall survey volume. And that comes down to the fact that if you do an estimate your correlation function on half the data, you expect errors to scale with square root of 2. You know? Because that's how it is. You know? Just basically. You know. And you can show with bootstrap or replacement that actually you don't end up with a full 100% of your data, but that's of the order of 70%. If you do twice the resampling rate, you go up to 80%. Three times, 95%. And empirically, we, should, we found that it was working for of the order of three times the resampling rate. But it's so time consuming. Jackknife gives you the same errors quickly. Now, diagonal errors. The covariance matrix is harder. So this is where you need to not start to wor worry about these small details and so on. And so th the bootstrap looks like this, standard error estimator. Jackknife usually looks like this, this n minus one factor comes in. And that's because pretty much you're resampling the same data many times. And so the general point is you don't know how to compare them. So that's internal ones. You can compare internal with external, which what I call external is like MOX, which is what I would call the st standard way of doing it. But they're not perfect MOX. You know, 100 MOX, 1,000 MOX, 5,000 MOX, 20,000 MOX is great. But what is your external data set including? Usually, visible statistical data properties, like luminosity and color, cor like the dependence of the clustering on those properties. Internal, by construction, they have them. External is possible, but not necessarily you have all of the information at that level. Hidden statistical data properties, what I mean by that? Higher statistics. We all know, if you do the, 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 the maths on it, that two-point correlation function errors depend on a four-point correlation function. That's part of it. I'm not going to compute a four-point correlation function to figure out my errors on a two-point correlation function. That's really hard. Because actually, I have huge uncertainty on my data to do that. The internal habit by construction, because it's the data set. The data set contain that information already, whether I can or not measure it. Yeah? The external, I would say hard towards impossible. Because you're not, you, I haven't seen any person doing mocks and make sure my four-point correlation function is accurate to, this accuracy, to that level in my, to my data, usually because it's very hard to actually measure it in the data and actually have that measurement pr precisely in all the ways. And there's so many ways of measuring higher statistics. You know, there's so many of them to actually measure. There's not like two points, it's actually a measurement. Construction stability of the covariance matrix. So internal data is unclear. Yeah? The no what is the noise in the recovery covariance matrix? It's unclear. You know? There's limitation because you have just that simple data to work with. Bootstrap is slightly better in this case because you can generate a large number of bootstrap realizations but be simply because there's so many opp opportunities. Dark knife is simply limited by the number you have. 
external, clearly, give me 10,000 marks and I, I'm going ahead, I'm, I'm happy. It's just maybe CPU intensive to find those 10,000 or whatever it is, but it's not the problem in that sense. Inclusion of large scale sample variants. Internal, they include them, but not really correctly, because actually very hard. Think about STS's Great Wall, goes through the whole sample. How on earth can I cut that one out? It's very, very hard. External, yes, but not always, because it depends if they are actually having the higher statistics rights as well. Yeah. Intrinsic limitation to the service size. Clearly, the internal ones will never be able to deal it. You have 100 square degrees, that's it. Do your best with 100 square degrees. Your simulation work, you can do it 1,000 square degrees, 10,000 square degrees. You know, the universe is your limit. So that's why it, it, it's actually quite good. So these are why you want to discuss these kind of different points of how to derive them, because there's not a way to do it. There's different ways, and they are complementary and, and so on. And I think I will stop here. Uh, this is my summary from, from this part one. So we, like, yesterday we talked about empirical uh, uh, characteristics. Today more about the intrinsic one, luminosity function, correlation function, a, a bit of a rant on, on stellar mass functions. Um, different types of surveys, galaxy formation versus cosmology, they have different aims. But the one thing I think is really good is that we live really in the right era for surveys. You know, it's, it's really getting fantastic in this all. And we carry on for a while, you know, at least in the mid 2030s, so it's quite a while. And plans are already starting to talk about the next ones. That's the nice thing as well. You just you know, see this carrying on and so on. So I think the future is very bright for this. So thanks. Do you press the button? Yeah. No, no, now it's on. No, and now it's on again. They Here. Told me it was oh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, concerning what are the characteristics you will ask for an estimator? You say this is a good one because it, and it's good to, to check with the Lansley and yeah, the Lansley, yeah. What are what what are the characteristics or what are the, the, the things you ask for, say, this is a good estimator? Uh, it's, it's the only way you can test it, the only way you can test it to some level is um, test against what you know is a true answer. You can actually do it analytically, you can work it out. You can show that these estimators are giving an unbiased result, you know, and they have good properties in terms of errors. You know, that's part of Landis Salais and, and, and Hamilton's work in 1993 when they wrote those papers that actually show that their, their errors on, uh, on the, stat uh, stat uh, the estimators are well behaved to first order. Yeah, but these errors are, are tiny. You know, like it's not, they were important in the days when you have very limited data. Today, that's not the cause of those ones being the issue. Now, the error is more not on the estimator, but actually in the data itself. You need to worry about how you model the data well enough, and so on. Um, and there are simple, simpler estimators, which just does DD over DR, which is a simpler one. It's perfectly fine. And you actually realize that it works very well as long as the sample is large. So the larger the sample is, the less problems you have. The smaller the sample is, the more things you need to worry about. So the best estimator often have were derived in data-starved times because they were obliged to devise estimate in that sense which could deal with it. Now what we need to worry about is more about the next level up is not just the estimator, is that the statistic we want to consider. Yeah, there's different ways of looking at different statistics. I used to do the standard two point creation function. They are compensated statistics. Which means that actually you have a, 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 a instead of looking at the, the standard two-point correlation function, you have a weighting function comes in, and so like Padmanabhan and and and, uh, and White, I'm trying to figure out who the third person was, um, have wrote, wrote about that in, in about uh, 2008, 2007, uh, and those ones are very nice, but they come with other difficult features, meaning a it's not readily available. Most people don't use them, so you can't compare with standard methods and so on. It depends on what the scales you want to look at. But it is, it's more about what is this, the measurement you want to do. So.
anybody else has any questions before the break? Okay, if now we're going to have a very short coffee break. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, it's it's going to be 10 minutes, so please keep nearby.
Oh, you're talking about only the night sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, so we are ready to resume the Peter's second part of the of today's lecture. Okay, um, so I'm here again. Um, so now we, we will with then with the real universe. I thought I should go into some of the fake universe problems because I think it's that's kind of like what's more relevant. And let's start with some historical background. So um, simulations have been used in earnest since the 1980s, really, to rule out models more precisely define favored ones and and so on in, in cosmology. And um, I like I like this picture here from one of the first mocks. is actually Davis et al. 1984 one for a CFA survey, where they have actually provided. Uh, two realizations of their uh, galaxy distribution, which is the real survey, which was is the, the fake universe. But this is done from simulation work, pure dark matter simulation. Yes? That's a 2D simulation? That is a, this is a simulation, a, a proper end body simulation done in the 1980s with probably something like 64 cubed particles. <laughs> uh, lots of hard work and sweat to run around on bizarre machines to actually have the punch card doing the job they want, but you know, it's the early days. I, I like it because it's actually quite interesting and uh, it only in the early days they started to be able to rule out some models or you know, find more favored ones and so on. Uh, and so on. So anyways, f for those who want to, so that's the homework to look it up. I can give you the answer uh, uh, another time if you want to. But that carried on, and let me see here, yes. But actually, the real large-scale breakthrough, oh my goodness grief, this doesn't come through very well, I'm sorry for that. Large-scale breakthrough of Marx come really with 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey. It had been before uh, uh, Marx and so on for surveys, but not to the same extent. And one of the things with 2DF and SDSS, which was very, very good for two surveys running in parallel, is that SDSS was clearly a superior data set compared to 2DF in the terms of homogeneity and larger volumes and so on. But one of the big differences for 2DF was the fact that there was mock simulation that they used a lot. And they did actually a lot of these kind of biased galaxy uh, uh, mocks. And where here is a light cone with the mass. Uh, distribution here and the galaxy distribution uh, can show, see how, how it looks like and this is kind of like a, an example of, of a, a, a model they, they, they use. Unfortunately, it didn't come out at all very well on the screen here, but if you look at Colatal 1998 or even better, you can go to, um, uh, I'll, I'll sh you will have those slides from my talk later on, you can actually see how, how well it works uh, and so on. But one thing I thought was really revealing in 1998 is I had forgotten about how little we knew about cosmology. And we really were working in different areas of simulations of type of considered. Um, and I think that's quite nice. Today, we actually tend to be always very much vanilla, standard lambda CDM, and there's not very much variety around it. But it's actually quite like, this is an example of tau CDM models, which is kind of, you know, historically interesting and, and, and so on. You, it will come back later on again, this tau CDM. Now, uh, so with these uh, simulations, we actually did uh, virtual and real universes. You know, there's a series of uh, maps here you can see between different ones. Again, the projector limitation. On the screen actually shows really well uh, all of these dots being galaxies and so on. And there is one of these simulations is the real. One of these cone plots is, is data and five of the other ones are simulations. And to some level, the game is to figure out not you know, why two things doesn't agree, but which is the one who stands out, the one which is different compared to all the, the real ones. So that's another homework, you, but the change to observe position with time is being set when you did the simulation. So once, once you've done something, that's it. If you didn't think about it when you run the simulation, tough. You're not going to be able to do it again unless you rerun the whole simulation. Yeah? So it's actually quite, ex it's exact, but has a lot of consequences with it. Okay. There's many types of mocks, yeah, and I, I will primarily focus on n-body simulation ones, yeah. So here I mentioned the n-body simulation ones first. So they are listed in order increasing mass re resolution requirements. So if you have n-body simulation where you have just dark matter particles, you can actually do galaxies, biased tracers of the dark matter density field, and there you can actually create ad hoc schemes to say how you should populate your galaxies into this, given the dark matter density field. Yeah, and um, so that's by far the cheapest uh, uh, version in this one. You have the halo catalog, 
okay? Galaxies reside in halos, and, and Aldo will tell more about this, and they are populated according to some assumed halo occupation distribution, HOD. Okay? It's a statistical method to create your mark with. You just need to know what is this HOD. Yeah? Subhalo catalog. Galaxies reside in subhalos, okay? so that is halos within halos to some level, and which are populated according to some predefined mechanism. You know, could be sham, so better. Um, Subhalo abundance matching. It could be some more complicated uh, version of this, but like all of the family of empirical models that all the present yesterday is in the way you're actually doing this on the marks and, and so on, creating marks from that. Uh, merger trees ones, and that's why the reason why they say merger trees is like you can have those with and without subhalos information. So galaxies reside in these halos or subhalos, and there is a proper evolutionary connection. So most sham will actually have this already in because to some level to understand how to get your subhalo and the properties of subhalo, you need to connect it with time because you need to know when did it fall in or what is the velocity, this peak velocity and so on. So you usually have merger tree, but it's much more indirectly written out. What I really mean by merger trees ones and, and so on is typically those galaxy formation models, similar to galaxy formation models, where you have a merger tree and that's how you create your, your, your galaxy. Um, much more complex and very neat ones is hydrodynamical simulations. Yeah? These are actually where you actually take, put in the gas physics and so on in them. Now they're really hard and really, really expensive. And on top of that, the largest box size available is of the order 100 megaparsec. It's tiny, you know, absolutely tiny volumes. But it's really hard work to do it. Eagle, illustrious, is the state of the art. And they get one simulation at the end of the day. Lots of simulation of smaller sizes, and that's it. Yeah. And if you know some uh, the clustering statistics, if you have a box of 100 megaparsec, note there's no H here. That's the classic thing. You know, if you want to sell something nowadays, you sell it. It's bigger. Bigger if you're, you remove your H. It becomes bigger naturally. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. Gee, what that annoys me. Because actually, everybody in clustering statistics and, and tend to work are in H inverse megaparsecs. And that is, don't fool yourself about it. That little H matters at that level, even though you have assumed it. But it just suddenly things become... So what it means that if you work with this 70 H inverse megaparsec, and if you know that clustering statistics are actually in your simulation, you actually don't, can't measure clustering st statistics out to those scales. So actually, you only measure them reliably out to one-tenth of your box size, typically. So you're talking about of the order of seven megaparsecs-ish you can measure reliably-ish your clustering statistics. Yeah. And so it's actually very limited in that sense, those simulations. And then you have the approximate simulations, which are really useful and very useful for, for, for large-scale surveys or for BAO, for example, uh, probes and so on, where you can either do two LPTs, LWH approximations to actually get your, 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 your density field out, you can look normal, there's actually a zoo now of methods. One of them is Kamuving Langrinshaw Acceleration Cola uh, uh, method. There is easy marks. There's, there's a whole zoo of them. And they, those ones are very dedicated to the probe you want to use. Yeah. So they're not as generic in their way. And those I will consider today and, and mostly will be those end body simulation ones. And, and but if you, if you want, I will, t I will see if I can put in something in the last lecture about these ones, which is more specific for, 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 for BAO studies and so on. But that's not really where I am, have, have lots of usage expertise and so on in them. So let's go into the bias dark matter uh, mark, dark, dark matter field marks. You know? So we came to the 2DF marks earlier on. So galaxies are biased tracer of the dark matter density field. So that's a good re there's a good reason to believe that, because if you measure correlation function in galaxies and you compare it to dark matter, it's pretty much a scaling part. I mean, actually it's, and, and the bias is not large to some level, you know, of the order of unity to a factor of a few. And there might be some scale dependence on the bias on the smaller scales, but on large scales are pretty, uh, 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 pretty uniform. So local bias in schemes in Cole et al. is that the your probability of a mass particle being selected is a function of the only of the neighboring density field. And the reason for doing that is the fact that that leads to scale and bias on large scales. So by construction, you've chosen a biasing scheme which so gives you a feature you like because on large scales, it does look pretty much uh, a scale independent bias to be right. So this is a way of actually creating in your, your, your biasing scheme to make sure that you end up with that. The broadly two types of biasing schemes, the Lagrangian ones, which is based on the initial density field, or Eulerian ones, which are based on the final density field. 
And typically, those which are based on initial density field work better because to some level, they have more information about how things are going to evolve to the structures that are today. And also goes back to the, the, the feeling of, 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 of big structures collapse earlier and so on. You have the information how they collapse and so on. Most successful uh, is the Lagrangian with selection probability defined in this kind of equation. I just give you an example of this. This is a probability of selecting a, 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 the, a, an object uh, to be a, a galaxy and depends on this new new, which is depending on a, a smooth de over density on a certain scale. You measure this over a, a, a like smooth density field and so on. And these are two parameters that you actually fit to some level, no more than that, to actually give you out your correlation function. It reproduces something which looks like the data and so on. The nice thing with this paper, and this is what I had completely forgotten about, and I, uh, that's why I enjoy doing this, this lectures, like there are a huge number of cosmologies. In 1998, it's not a long time ago. Yeah, you have open, you have flat, you have COBE, you have cluster normalized, tau CDM, you have all these kind of things that are completely gone out of the window because we know, nail it down to be, sigma 8 is, should be 0.8, uh, or omega matter should be 0.27, whatever it is in details, from Planck 1 or whatever. So it's actually quite nice because it's actually quite interesting to see those things, to realize that not long time ago you, you had to simulate a large variety of models, and on top of that, do Bison scheme on them. Whereas now, it's, it's, you're working much more of a fixed situation. So, okay, so I'm going to skip these two slides because I don't think... Yep? So, uh, you have a lot of thermometer particles. Yep. And then you have a, prob a probability of selecting one as a galaxy. Yep. And then the program just runs on the seeds. And then, then you and then with the, with the seed and you take out, this becomes my galaxy. Okay. To some level, there's nothing more than that. The nice thing with it is it actually doesn't require very high resolution. Because the document doesn't feel it's actually quite well populated in that sense. And um, it does a good job of reproducing the, the two point correlation function because you've tuned it to do that. But the main reason it works well is because, to zeroth order, the galaxy distribution is pretty much looked like dark matter, the correlation function. It's not that far off. Now, if you had a huge variety of models, the correlation function of dark matter will vary, and therefore you have much more biasing uh, uh, assumption you can play with. But here, you don't have that problem in the same way. Now, I'm just going to skip over these two. This was an example of two slides. I could, you could flip between and see the differences, but you can't see anything on it, so i just move over to the next ones. Halo catalog marks. So these were typically the SDSS Las Damas marks, which are done. So Aldo will tell you everything you need to know this afternoon about uh, HODs. No pressure there, Aldo. Um, <laughs> but the one thing is, Basically, if you have a model of how to, populate your how to populate your halo with galaxies, you can actually then decide, using a simulation, to populate it statistically with galaxies in. And there are some assumptions you have to make here. Yeah. But this is an example of two uh, marks they have done the, with the, the um, different simulation sizes and so on for different samples. And you can see how well it works you know, with, with scatter, different realizations, different lines and so on. And this is the measurement. Yeah. And to some level, this is great. It gives you, giving a set of data, you can create something which looks statistically equivalent to the data, yeah, to some, to some level. Yeah. There is a, you know, there's works of trying to look into HD evolution and so on, and I'll just highlight this work of Contreras et al., which recently been put on our archive, giving a information on how to make your HD parameter evolve with time if you have some, from some field with that. Because that is something you don't have in HD models, you just have it at this time, you actually see how it looks like. Now, HD marks some practical comments, and this is where my, my comment comes in about definitions. So, it's not just observers who worry about definitions. Actually, theory, theory people have to worry about it as well, simulators and so on. And there is a massive divide in masses definition. It's hilariously funny. You know, where do you define it versus critical density or mean density? Is it two times the mean density? Mean density is a 200 times the critical density. Is the virial density or mean virial? Have all these options you can choose. It's great. Nobody re Some people do it well in saying what they're using. But the problem with this is there's also an Atlantic divide, which is funny. Europe mainly work in critical. And in, in, in America, most of the people tend to work in mean. I don't know where it, it comes back from. No, it comes back actually from, the, from um, uh, uh, who are the main simulators in Europe. It's the Frank and White people. And that's the vertical consortium and their way of working. 
and in, in, in the US as in other groups. So that's where it actually has diverged and so on. It doesn't matter, it's a definition. But if you're not in the game of doing these definitions or knowing exactly what they are, it's so easy just to get confused or just using something thinking it is, and then it shows up differentness. So different, these must have different rigid dependencies as well. You know, that's the other thing. You can, so therefore, you might just end up with different numbers. It's, it's the same idea as my luminosity function or stellar mass function. They're different, small difference in qu quantitatively. No, no, nothing more fundamental there. Hale definitions, what you're using for Hale definition to find these masses depends on if you're just using friends of friends halos, subfind or rockstar halos. They will also matter to figure out what is your mass of these halos and so on. Halo mass functions, yeah? Because your HOD depends on a halo mass function, which fitting formula, Tinker, Jenkins, Warren, three small dots, there's loads of them, <laughs> or the intrinsic one on the simulation. All of these things will matter to the level you're trying to populate these simulations, and they will, will have more or less problem, you know, you, we have to think more or less about it. The bias function, meaning how, how halos are biased uh, with respect to dark matter, and, and, and and Aldo will come back to this as well, is an intrinsic one of simulation in perfect agreement with the one used for the analysis. Because somebody has done an analysis and given you a HD model, are they compatible? All of these small things tend to come and bite you when you do these marks, which is a, just a painful act of it. So it's simple, but you just need to worry about it, think about it. And you have a radial density profile, which is part of the, uh, the HD model as well, you need to think about. Okay. So many abundance catalogs, sham or empirical models, you know, to some level, that Aldo covered it uh, nicely yesterday. The key points I want to make sure, which comes into the, the mock realization part of it. Yeah, so basic sham has, to some level, the one with no scatter, has no free parameter, but depends on matching variable and their definitions, you know, VP, Vmax, MIM fall, and whatever you can choose, and how they have defined them. Yeah, numerical resolution of simulation, that will also matter at this level, how you define things. Halo merger trees will matter at this level. So there are all these small things, so trying to reproduce somebody else's work is actually very hard because you need to worry about these things which are not free parameters. They are part of the whole thing. Yeah? So it's, it's actually quite important to be aware of this. Uh, unlike HD, HD marks, the sham ones, there's a formalism for evolution because they built the merger trees, basically. Yeah? Unlike HD marks, they have a potential to provide predictions, but I'm not sure it's been explored yet very much, but that thing I think is just a question of time. Shime is kind of younger in that sense. Like the HD marks, there will be back construction mimic very well, and I've seen this very well learning, the range of observ observable data to which they have been statistically tuned, because you have forced it to look like the clustering. You know? There's no surprise here that actually they, you're going through that well. Actually, I'm really surprised you don't go better through it at some level, because the, you have tuned the model to be very accurate at that. And the reason I stress this is because the next set of models, the marks I'm talking about, is the semantic ones. And they are not tuned at all in the same way, and there's no reason that they should be able to do the same accuracy. So they have very big difference there. So the merge tree marks, what are called the Galform uh, marks type, for example, or so they're very similar to galaxy formation. You have Galform L galaxies and different derivatives of them, Galacticus, Sage, and so on. There's lots of there's many more, but they're kind of like the, the main ones. But construction such models are suited for creation of marks because they have this whole nature of they create a galaxy formation model that have all the properties as function of redshift. So it's ideal to create a mark with it in that sense. Key limitations. High-level models, they're really hard to use. And if you really want to go the ins and outs of it, I'm going to give you just a brief uh, insight of it tomorrow, you can read some of the semantic papers which want to become really open about the parameter, parameters to use and parameterization to have. You take a step back and start thinking, is this something I want to get on with before having understood the details? Because it's not simple, you know? Um, and it's, 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 it requires significant expertise in using and running them. Yeah. And I, I think it's not an understatement. Yeah, I mean, many of those things are inconsistent, actually. Internally inconsistent. So that's the other problem as well, is what has been implemented, and what is it physically, or is it empirically implemented? So a model should not do empirical implementation, because it's meant to be a galaxy formation model with physics. 
you know, or where you prioritize the physics to your best knowledge. But if it becomes empirical, empirical then you have lost that part. So you need to figure out what are the, the limitations of it. Accuracy with which the observable can be matched despite model being tuned. So you can't necessarily, there's no reason that your model you have, you have defined with an and, uh, ab initio uh, um, uh, parameter and so on will be able to predict or will be able to match the observed data. Yeah. So there, that, there's a limitation that. Yeah. So, the, but the, that's a limitation. But the strength is that it has a predicted power well in advance of data being available. Because you actually can say, having tuned it to redshift zero or to some data set at some redshift, you can give some prediction of what it should look like. So it actually is really useful in that respect. It's, they it provide a consistent, consistent set of observables from the marks. The nice thing with this is like you have a galaxy which have properties, it's consistent within the model. The model is consistent in its own right. However, do not need to match the real data. So, it's a bit of a problem, yeah? But it's a strength as well, because you have consistency. It's not as if you've decided these ones should be bright, and then on another brand, in order to make it match, I have to make it really faint. No, it just, there's a consistent way of doing it. So there is pros and cons with this. So the n-body marks, pros and cons, basically, I've done this little list here. The minimum mass resolution, you can see here that bias dark matter marks is the ones which have the least amount of, of, of uh, constraint on. But if you really go to sham and sound, semantics, so you really need higher number densities, you know, the, the, in, the, in the particle mass. Yeah. Merger trees for the two latter ones are important. Light cone output only. If you only have light cone output, you can't do really sham or, or, or semantics on it because you don't know the history. You don't know how to connect things with time. So you need to have this merger tree. So light can produce merger tree is when you actually can do sham and, and uh, semantics. Cosmological volume, the snapshot side of it. Yes, you, what I mean by this is just large, very large simulations. Okay, these two, straightforward, because we can do that. Sham and semantics, not yet, it's in the way. Because what I mean cosmological volume is of the order of gigaparsec cube, meaning couple of gigaparsec cube volumes. And that's, at that master resolution, there's not that many simulations available, and it's on the process of trying to do this work on. Cos cosmological volume and light cones for biased dark matter that exist, that's, uh, I'm gonna show some later on. Uh, HRDs, it's in progress, maybe not, but this is still uh, a way to do, uh, in those ones, in maybe to do the simulations and run them and then get the whole merge trees on them. It's just a question of computational power of doing to save everything and, and do it. So I'm just gonna give the last few, three slides about light cones from Hubble to Euclid via the mice and so on. And a light cone simulation is actually principle simple. You run the standard n body code as you've done it before and just to create output of a subset of data at much higher time resolution than standard snapshots. So that you actually get the information on the light cone. Now, it's, in words, easy to say, you need to code it up a bit, but it's not, you know, impossible. Some deprivation might be required. That's it. You think, oh, great. It should be done all the time. You see, it's so simple. If it's in the, why is it not regularly done? Typical simulator don't see much use of light data as such from the starting point, because it's very limited in its usage, and it has all of the, the, uh, the evolution with time, whereas snapshots is well constrained, you know, understand how to measure, the, the correlation function is easy, and so on. And because are not set up to provide light code outputs directly. Snapshot information often sufficient, but not always, yeah? If you have enough snapshots, you can create what you want a uh, light code output. But some cases, if you do lensing, <laughs> yeah, or CMB work, as, as, as Sam mentioned yesterday, then you light cone is, becomes more and more interesting to have because you want to be able to follow exactly the path and so on. Light cone output is cheap in terms of space. Typically 50% of the particles information of one single snapshot for an octant of, the, of this guy and much less for any deeper option. So actually it's, it's not, space is not the issue. Yeah. But usually one light cone per observer per run unless different are set up from the start. Means that you need to start thinking at the start of it when you run it how many you can do and now what you want to do with it. And if you don't see a direct application, why would you do the extra effort to do this and so on? So this is the hard, hard, hard problem, why it's not uh, necessarily done. So, you know, light cones, there's been a couple of ones in the, in, in, in the years. The Hubble volume, 
didn't take us actually two, three, two and a half, two years to run, but it's actually over a year uh, between split between machines and so on. But that was one of the first big light cones being done, gigaparsec box. And this you can see the light cone. This is the evolution of dark matter density field and so on. This is two gigaparsecs uh, along the line of sight. And this, actually, uh, two seconds. This is, the t this is the deeper one. This is not the full, full sky part. And this is a, is a smaller version. So you have different ver versions. You have different observers positioned at different places and looking at different orientation, open different satellite angles. So you create an action in the, in, the, in the Hubble volume, create actually one, two, three, four, five, six different light cones in one go. So it is possible in that sense. Um, and then, but has very limited mass resolution uh, in this case. MySCON challenge, more recently done, had about 70 billion uh, particles as a mass resolution of 10 to 10. And, and you can get this kind of like simulations out. And that's been actually quite used uh, heavily in towards the uh, DES collaboration because that's where you start lensing and so on. That was the motivation to actually do this and so on. And then uh, you have the most recent one, what's called the Euclid flagship simulation. It's a 2 trillion particle in a 3.8 gigaparsec box, which has a mass resolution of 210 to the 9 uh, and so on. And um, I say it's a Euclid reference cosmology. I really tried to figure out what that cosmology was. I couldn't find it. But it said it's Euclid reference cosmology, so it must be great. Uh, but I, uh, I'll try to figure out what the numbers are. It's just one of these things, you do some document uh, far away. But the thing what is nice with this one is actually it's a very high resolution simulation, 10 to 9, with a proper light cone, but they don't have a snapshot information for it, so you can't, they haven't constructed merger trees. Are there no merger trees in this? No! Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is an example of they went they weren't, they weren't the whole thing, through, and it's because they could not do both things in the size of the machine they had. Wait, I completely missed that. What's yeah. They don't have merger trees. They have just the light cone information output. And the reason they have that is because for constructing a merger tree, you actually need to do snapshots output, storing that, and then linking the snapshots together. And that's a state data storage issue, and then post-processing. Or you can do it on the fly, and you need to know how to do it on the fly. And that was not possible in this case. Uh, that means that unless they look at their whole data all in one chunk, they can no, it's not. What, no, no, no. So what you have is actually you have all of, you have a halos. You have all the halos in this. You have all the particles. You have all the halos in this light cone. But you don't have the whole simulation, 3.8 gigaparsec box simulation with all of the um, uh, uh, like a snapshot at different times. So you don't have a merger tree. The limitation of this one becomes you can't do uh, uh, shams or uh, semantic models on it. You can only do HOD model on it. So, mock centrical part of lens today, mock design closely related to science goals. That one was clearly related to the science goal for Euclid because they need a lensing part, and HOD was initially enough. And for the specific mock development happens often, more often, uh, uh, off, most often when needed, and the various reasons, not when they actually want to plan them in advance. Limited use on their own right. Mocks requires actually figuring out what they need it for, and it requires significant amount of work to develop. Yes, yeah, so you don't create a mock for the fun of it. You only need to figure out what it's going to be used for. And that there's usually a the tension between the two developments and so on. Okay, so this is it for, for today. Thanks. Do we have any questions? Uh, why are approximate AO and RSD studies? Okay, so BAOs, yes, RSDs is less clear to me. Okay. I'll tell you why, is pro mo mainly because they're working in a much linear regime, so it's actually much easier to work with in that respect. So you don't need to worry about all the nonlinear effects coming in the same extent. So that is primarily that, that reason why the approximate methods are, are, uh, are, are okay. Rich-based distortion depends on which scales you want to work with, and that depends on which scale are these approximate marks accurate, and different marks are accurate to different scales. So that becomes a whole debate on how to use them. But it's a, it's a, there's a whole you know, work in many large, uh, large surveys and so on, which is dedicated to that. Thank you. So I had a question about yeah. HODs, right? So, so take, for example, um, something like ALGs. So yeah. Right? Um, Hello? Yeah. So, so it would seem that, you know, so for example, for LRGs, you say, okay, you know, if I'm in the 
they're typically at the center of halos, and so you have a certain, not only do you have an HOD, but you kind of have some physical logic about the shape of the HOD. But for ELGs, it's more complicated. I mean, you wrote a paper. Right? Yeah. Right. So it seems to me if you didn't have all of these ideas, you could just book, make arbitrary fitting forms. And so the clustering is probably not sufficient to tell you the uniqueness of the HOD, right? Yeah. So, so how much of an issue is that? Because I've seen like different ELG HODs which are completely different, and yet they kind of fit the current. Is the is the degeneracies of what do you want to do? If you want to have a mark which just produced the right clustering, it doesn't matter how your HOD looks like. Exactly. But. That also is a concern because you actually think that you're putting constraints on your 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 model of saying like so the degeneracies are huge, yeah, and that's it's not it's not clear at all to me. It ju that's where you need to worry about what is the end game of this. Yeah, you know, I, I and you're probably gonna you might address this more. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think the main problem is how to divide the subpopulations for HODs. I mean, in the sense, for example, if you if you want to do galaxy evolution and you you know, as Peter showed, that there are blue and red galaxies. What is the HOD for blue and, and, and red galaxies? And how do you divide? How do you define their? Okay. No. Okay. And how do you find the HOD for of them? And actually, how how to feed the HODs? Do you have to do it separately or at the same time? I think it's the same problem for yeah, this similar. kind of sub, sub yeah. populations. You need to define. I mean, uh, this is j just parametrizations, and whatever you put to the parametrizations, I mean, uh, whatever you, you put to the data to, f to feed on, uh, you always will feed everything, no? Yeah, and it, it doesn't mean that it's correct, but here's where more uh, work is required. But to to some level, you can better. actually test this, because you have, first of all, more than one decoration function. Right. You can use higher statistics. Uh -huh. to test it as well with. Yeah, and you can, you can do cross correlations and so uh -huh. on. So there is more probes that one should be using to yeah. make sure that how to solve these degeneracies. And uh -huh. then that requires more work on the modeling aspect. Right, right. But it's, right. It is, it's possible, but it just, I think it's now we're coming up to a level that we need to worry, think about it more carefully. Right, uh -huh. I agree. Note though that what I said about the data is great. But if you don't have the data, then you're stuck in position one. You don't know how to predict it. We have one more up here. Hi. Uh, so you have this function that gives you the probability of a halo being, mm -hmm. of a dark matter halo having a galaxy, right? And I'm guessing that this function depends on what your observable. Like it's probably different from quasars that from emission line galaxies or something like that. Yep. Uh, how would I find the parameters if I'm changing observables on my probability function? So the, the thing is you need, HODs intrinsically need a measurement to start off with. Okay. If you have no data, you're stuffed, to be fair enough. Yeah, there's no way you can do it. HOD has no predictive power at that level. Whereas that's where you can start off with thinking about, hey, let's look at my galaxy formation model. I might not trust it in details. But what does it do? So the first HOD models for ELGs actually are very much motivated by finding galaxy formation models. You actually can see that it's how they are, not the standard shape of them and so on. So you, that's how you work forward. But that's a worrying thing as well because we know the galaxy formation models are not accurate to that level. So, you know, but it gives you an idea of where to work towards. Yeah. So, but yeah, without the data, HOD, I, you, you were mentioning something about the initial mass function. Yeah. So I was wondering, I suppose that you have some different kind of different simul embodied simulations by taking different uh, initial mass, mass function. Uh, how important is this difference when you change the initial mass function? So, so in pure embodied simulation, the initial mass, initial mass function doesn't matter at all because doesn't it's just matter dark matter. matter. Because it yeah, doesn't come in at all. Yeah, but you are. But in my galaxy sure. formation model, it uh -huh. does matter. Yes. Yeah. And in uh -huh. that sense, I would need to change all my parameters, yeah. which are tuned to observ observational data, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. different ways. Yeah. And and that can come, can have a lot of consequence of how yeah. you're gonna tune it and so on. Mm -hmm. 
That's where you, one need to remember that a galaxy formation model, the parameters in those semantic models, don't have a meaning more than scaling relations. Mm -hmm. They don't have the meaning of, let's say, some parameter alpha is 1.03, mm -hmm. has no more meaning than it would be 0.78. Does, it's a scaling relation yeah. that you're being used in some level. Yeah. So in that sense, but all of those parameters are correlated, yeah. and it might show that you cannot, with some initial mass function, reproduce the data equally well. Yeah. yeah. And for example, if you change the cosmology... Oh, cosmology? You change cosmology, no, all no, the no. parameters have to re, uh, be yeah. changed again. Yeah, yes. but I mean... What I am trying to ask is if you if you can find some kind of degeneracy between oh. changing, uh, let's say, with uh, lambda CDM by changing the omega matter today and changing the uh, initial mass function. Oh, the degeneracies same. are huge. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't, there's like there's, there's no yeah. you know no end to degeneracies in that yeah, respect. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. uh, in, in sense like galaxy information model as such, they will not be able to constrain your cosmology yeah, or so anything like that. So. It, you have to take something from given, what uh -huh. is the cosmology, and then yeah. you try to fit your parameters to your, your observed observe yeah. data, and then you try to make a prediction, and looking at some other, like, and then you make a prediction, and then you see how well does that match, you know, and trying to understand that one. Or do you need more physics or less physics, or what do I need to change? But it's a very complicated process yes, in that I sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, um, so the, a clear weakness, is the fact that the parameters depend strongly on your the online cosmology. Yeah, but yeah. at some level, it's not an issue. It was an issue many years ago because the cosmology was so uncertain. Yeah, but that's but now, today, <laughs> the cosmological parameters yeah. are pretty much nailed down. Well, by under Lambda So CDM that's under Lambda CDM model, yes. Yeah. But ma ma most of them are still nailed down at that level that you're not going to change the baryon fraction by a factor of two. Yeah, but in the early 2000s, you would have changed it by a factor of two. And there were predictions in the models in the early 2000s, which are no longer there in 2005, because omega baryon has changed. And they were just driving from one side to the other, and that made changes in the predictions of the models. Okay. So those are the limitations with it on the cosmology side. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, well, if there's no further questions, we thank Peter again. No, no, no.
Is it showing there? No. Don't know what happens. Oh, yeah, Marina. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Like the. Somebody has another adapter? Yeah, is there a detector? Detector, Christine? Probably she just get this. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Is it, it's not uh, in. Yeah, in, uh, it's going, it's going, it's going. Great. Thanks very much. Um, right, so I realized that uh, this uh, lecture will have some overlapping with what someone discussed this morning. But I hope that uh, the overlapping is not big and uh, uh, that I'll be talking about this uh, in a slightly different way. So um, yesterday we reviewed some of these um, most popular non-standard models to explain the cosmic acceleration. And we realized that uh, those uh, models often involve quite nonlinear field equations which need to be solved if we want to accurately predict their cosmological behavior. So in the next two lectures, uh, I will talk about the simulation technicals that we uh, often employ to do simulations for these models. So this lecture will be focused on um, a description of mesh-based n-body simulation techniques. So as I said, um, for these non-standard models we have seen yesterday, um, many of them predict a new force, and that new force is unlike the standard gravitational force in the sense that for standard gravity, uh, if you add more particles, you simply add all the passes, sorry, all the forces that are produced by these particles. But this is not true for uh, the non-standard models. And this is the example we saw yesterday for the chameleon case. We saw that uh, if you have a single particle, it produces uh, some new force. But if you put uh, more particles around this new particle, around this single particle, then the force, the new force that it produces becomes shorter range, becomes weaker and weaker. So this means that uh, uh, what you really have is the environmental dependence of this new force. And for this reason, there is no uniform, uh, universal force law that you can use to add up forces produced by individual particles. As a result, you have to solve the field equation. And this is best done on, on a mesh. And this is just one example showing how uh, nonlinear you can expect the, uh, the equation to become. Uh, you can see that you have a linear term which is a uh, standard Laplacian of the scalar field. You have the coupling with matter and then you have derivative self-couplings and these can have quite high order terms. And it is those terms that is the problem that causes uh, uh, high degree of nonlinearity in these models, which need to be taken care of before you can accurately study these models. Yeah, as I said, so in this lecture, I'll mainly focus on n body simulations using particle mesh technical. And uh, uh, so for most of this talk, I'll talk about uh, the standard technical, and I will leave the application to non standard models to the next lecture tomorrow. So we have seen that uh, for n-body simulations, we have two different classes of technicals. We have particle methods, we have mesh methods, or grid methods, some people call them. And for particle methods, it is um, uh, logically quite straightforward. So what you have is um, you can calculate the force that is produced by individual particles, and then you sum uh, over all the particles. And because for standard gravity, you have a universal analytical force law, which is 1 over R squared. You can do this summation quite straightforwardly. And there, there is uh, efficient algorithms, such as tree algorithms, which can help you to do this uh, quite quickly in simulations. 
for non-standard models, as we discussed just now, we need to, um, we don't have a universal force law to sum, and we have to solve the nonlinear differential equation, and this differential equation can be solved on a mesh. And then, once we have solved the scalar field, we can take the differentiation or derivative of the scalar field on the mesh again, and calculate the force that is mediated by the scalar field. And for that reason, we bypass the need of a direct summation, which we can't do here. So how this uh, particle mesh or PM method works, and it is very simple. So basically, you have a mesh which uh, has a uniform resolution. And this mesh covers the whole simulation box, which in most cases is a cubic box. Uh, so I use this, um, this small squares to denote the cells of this mesh. And uh, the blue dots are the particles. So I use uh, this picture uh, often in this lecture to describe the whole configuration. So to do a particle mesh simulation, uh, like any other simulation, you need to start from some initial condition. And that is basically um, some initial distribution of particles in this simulation box. And there are various ways to generate initial conditions, and I think someone will discuss this tomorrow, so I will not go to details. Um, so what you have is some initial distribution of particles on this mesh, like this blue dot. And, and then you want to solve uh, the Poisson equation, which gives you uh, the potential. But for that, you know, the, the right-hand side of the Boson equation is basically the density field. So you need to uh, have a density field on this mesh. Basically, you have a density value at the center of each cell in the mesh. So you can do that uh, through density assignment. There are different schemes to do density assignment, as we saw earlier this morning. Um, so some of the most quite often used examples are NGP, which is short and writing of nearest grid point method. So in this method, you just assign the mass of the particle to the cell that contains the particle. So in this sense, uh, the particle only affects the density field in the single cell here. And then on the next level, you have the so-called cloud in cell or CIC interpolation scheme. What you have here is um, you assume that the particle's mass is uniformly distributed in a cloud which has the same size as a cell. So you can see that uh, this, this cloud is centered at the particle, which is uh, highlighted in red. And uh, this cloud has overlapping with four nearby cells. And a fraction of the particle's mass will go to each of these cells. And that fraction is determined by the volume of the overlapping. So this is uh, conceptually quite straightforward to do. And, and you can see that in 2D case, um, this method means that the mass of a particle will be distributed to four cells. And of course, in, um, in 3D, it will be distributed in more cells. And, and also, next level, you have the so-called triangular-shaped cloud, or TSC method. And, and in the 2D case, the particle's mass is distributed to uh, nine nearby cells, which are uh, those cells in the orange box. So this is a bit more detail of how this uh, uh, works. So for the NGP case, what you have is, um, so this is a 1D illustration of how it works. Uh, you can see um, here, this is one cell size, this is another cell size. So basically, this blue, sorry, this black point is a particle. This particle lives in the middle cell. So its density field is assumed to be a delta function uh, for the NGP case. And for the CIC case, its density field is a uniform distribution with a width of cell size. And for the TSC case, its density field is a triangular-shaped distribution, uh, which spans about uh, uh, two cell size. So you can see why it is called a triangular-shaped cloud in this case. If you want to do some uh, calculation, you can calculate uh, 
uh, more quantitatively, what is the fraction of, of a particle's mass that goes to each cell. So assuming uh, delta x i is the distance between a cell center and the particle position in the s direction, um, then for the NGP case, this fraction of the particle's mass will go to the cell. So it is defined in this way, and if the distance is smaller than half of the cell size, then it's one. That means that the particle is inside the cell and so on. So if you are careful enough, it's easy to check that this formula work. Uh, so if you want to write your ONPM code, which uh, I think you have been recommended to do, uh, this is probably one of the steps that you need to follow at the very beginning. But this is a very useful practice. One of my friends told me that you can write a PM code in one week uh, and he's good at prog programming. I'm not sure I can do that, but maybe you can do it. Uh, of course, without parallel reading. So, <laughs> this is also uh, already covered by Soman. So, we have different orders of the uh, density assignment schemes. In the lowest case, we have the NGP, or NGP assignment, and this gives you a quite noisy density field. And if you go to higher and higher order, like CIC, um, uh, TSC, and PCS, and so on, you get more and more smooth density field. And this uh, will allow you to use higher and higher order Boson solver to solve the Boson equation. But the drawback is that if you go to the more higher order terms, uh, you potentially face a loss of small-scale resolution. And, and for that reason, what is most often used is the CSA scheme. So it's a balance between not being too noisy and not being too smooth. And I have to say that in some of the n-body simulation codes uh, for non-standard models, TSC is a slightly better option because it gives you a slightly smoother density field which means that uh, uh, the equation is easier to solve. So once you have um, got a density field by doing density assignment, the next step, of course, will be to solve the Poisson equation on the mesh. So basically, you want to solve the potential of, of gravity, the Newtonian potential, at the center of each cell. I call it phi IJK. Here, IJK means uh, the S cell in X direction, J cell in Y direction, and, and K cell in the Z direction. And for doing this in PM code, you, you can use two methods. You can use the fast free transform method. And this is uh, uh, fast. And it is very efficient. But probably one limitation is that this method best works for linear differential equations. So if you have nonlinear equations, uh, it will not work, at least will not work in its for, uh, simplest form. And alternatively, you have this so-called relaxation method, which will be discussed later uh, in this lecture. So normally, when you want to solve a Poisson equation, again, the Poisson equation can be written in this way. So the Laplacian of uh, the Newtonian potential can be written as the sum of second derivatives with respect to x, y, and z coordinates. Um, but this is not the equa equation that you solve directly in n-body simulations, because this equation, you can see that it has uh, variables that has dimension, has unit. And this is not very convenient, because uh, that means that if you use different units, you get different answers. And if your unit is chosen not properly, then the values of these quantities could be uh, quite extreme, or extremely big, or extremely small, which is not very good for numerics. So what would people normally do is that they do some uh, unit change. They change this to in internal unit. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about how this internal unit works, because different people can use different uh, conventions. But the point is that after doing this change of unit, what you get is a um, slightly different equation with different variables. It has the same form, but uh, these quantities now involved in this equation will be dimensionless. So for example, zo here basically will be uh, the local density divided by the mean density. And uh, in the background universe, this zo will be one. 
And to solve the Boson equation, of course, you also need to uh, discretize the Boson equation on the mesh. So for example, you have a first derivative of the Newtonian potential phi with respect to x coordinate. And this, of course, we know is a continuous variable. But on the mesh, we only evaluate quantities at the same For that reason, before solving the Boson equation, we need to discretize the Boson equation. And one example for doing uh, this is here. So for this quantity d phi dx, um, this is the derivative with, with respect to x. Consider you have three ne nearby cells, the s cell, the i minus one cell, and i plus one cell. So you can, for the first order derivative, you have different ways to calculate it. You can calculate this as the difference between the phi value in these two cells divided by the cell separation, which is h, and, this, and that is given here. Or you can use these two cells to do it. And alternatively, you can calculate this as the difference between i plus 1 and i minus 1 cells, but divided by twice the cell size, because now this distance is twice cell size, and that is given here. This is uh, more symmetric, so this is what people normally use. Um, following the same logic, you can calculate the second derivative of phi with respect to any coordinate, so you just need to first calculate uh, the first order derivative in nearby cells, and then do that again to get the second order derivative. If you follow that process correctly, we find something like this. So the second derivative of phi would basically be um, the value in i plus one cell plus the value in this cell minus two times the value in this cell divided by h squared. So after you do that, you can discretize the Poisson equation and it gives you something uh, that looks like this one. It is a bit longer, but the good thing is that now this equation uh, becomes a linear algebra equation for phi ijk. And remember, phi ijk is, um, is the, the value of the potential in the ijk cell. So you can do the, if you want to use the fast Fourier transform method, you can do the Fourier transform of this discretized equation, and that gives you something like this. So you also need to tra uh, Fourier transform the density field, uh, apparently, and that gives you this. So then this is a pure algebra equation for uh, the case Fourier mode of phi, for which you can solve uh, the Fourier transform of the potential phi. And then you do the inverse Fourier transform to go back to the zero space. And, and by doing that, you get the value of the potential in the IJ case cell. After doing that, you have a potential field on this mesh. So what you need to do is now next uh, evaluate the force. So what you do is that uh, the force is basically the spatial derivative of the potential. So the x component will be just this, which we have seen just now. So there's one caveat which is already mentioned today, and that is uh, the force that is calculated in this way, basically, is the force component at the center of a cell. It is not necessarily the force that is up on the particle. The particle is not necessarily at the center of a cell. So what you need to do is you need to interpolate uh, the force components from the cell centers to the particle positions. And for doing that, we use the same uh, interpolation scheme as you use for density assignment in order to make sure that momentum is conserved, because otherwise you will get into trouble. Right, once you have done that, you can um, calculate uh, the force, which is basically this. So you use the force to update the velocity or momentum of a particle, and then you use the updated velocity to update the position of a particle. And here is how you do it. You can, you can update the velocity of a particle and the, and the position of, of a particle at the same time. Uh, that's no problem, but that is not very accurate. So what is usually used is a so-called leapfrog scheme, 
what you have here is that you shift the update of velocity and the position uh, a bit. So for example, uh, at time step n, you update the positions, and you don't update the velocity. And then at n plus a half, you update the velocity. And then n plus one, you update position, and so on. So this will shift the updates of positions and the velocities by half time step. And by doing this, you can ensure that this time in integration scheme gives you second order accuracy. OK, so once you have done that, um, you get um, particle movement to get a new distribution of particles, because particles will no longer be in their original position. So you will repeat the whole process again, calculate the density field, the potential field, the force, uh, update the particle positions, and do this so uh, on and on into uh, the time which is today, or any other time you want the simulation to, to stop. And, and then you get the final result. So this is basically a, a rough logic plot of how the PM method works. I'm not trying to be accurate here, because this is not a guideline for you to write the PM code, but this is just the basic idea how it works and some of the most important concepts. So PM method is very simple. As I said, you can write a PM code probably within one week. Uh, you can use it to solve the Boson equation, and you can use it to solve um, some of the non-standard gravity equations, uh, which we will cover next lecture. And that is very nice. However, there's some limitations. One limitation is that the PM method, uh, well, you can use FFT. And FFT is very efficient, as we have just talked. But FFT normally works for linear equations. So if you have a nonlinear equation, such as uh, what you routinely encounter in non-standard models, then the FFT method may not work. Uh, and then that means that you have to find a different way to do it. And also, this is also mentioned uh, already, for PM method, you have a uniform uh, resolution of the mesh. And that means that, um, uh, so if you think about the matter distribution in the universe, in some regions, the density is extremely high. And those regions, clearly, you need high resolution. And in other regions, you get almost no matter. So for those regions, probably the resolution is not necessarily, not, it doesn't need to be that high. So if you choose your match resolution to make sure that you get sufficient resolution in high density regions, then clearly you are wasting a lot of time in low density regions. And this waste can be dramatic. And alternatively, if you choose your uh, resolution, match resolution, to be just sufficient for low density regions. This, of course, will speed up your simulations, but this will give you very poor accuracy in high density regions, which is also what you don't want. So, for this reason, we have to have different methods uh, to PM, and uh, one of these methods is the particle, particle, particle mesh method, or P3 method, uh, P3M method. <laughs> so, for this method, you use uh, the advantage of PM method to calculate the long range force, but on small scales, uh, you use direct summation, uh, which is basically a particle uh, approach to sum the short range force. Um, so this, this, this is quite convenient, but of course, because you, you are doing direct summation of forces at cell size, so you are still doing direct summation, which is not possible for non-standard models. And that means that this method is not very practical for our purpose. And for that reason, we will come to uh, what people call adaptive mesh refinement method, or AMR. So this method is, uh, the, the logic is, uh, is quite simple. What you have is, uh, you start from um, initially uniform mesh. Mesh has a uniform resolution. It covers the whole simulation domain, which is the simulation cubic box. And, and then if you think that there are some regions where density is high and you want high resolution, then you can put another mesh, which is finer, usually with half of the original cell size to that region, and use the new mesh to solve the force and potential in that region. And if you have even higher density regions, you can do this again, have an even higher resolution mesh. And by doing this, you can have a hierarchy of 
meshes with different resolutions that are suitable for different density regions. So this is very convenient. The only thing you need to think of is uh, you need a trigger of the refinement. So normally, um, the trigger is given by the density. So if a density is exceeding some preset criteria uh, or threshold in the cell, then you split the cell into eight sun cells and so on. But this is not always true. Always true. Sometimes people use other criteria to refine cells. In our simulations, we mostly use density fields because we do n-body simulations and density field is the most straightforward quantity to use. So this is one example showing how the AMR method works. So you have a uniform mesh, which is the same as what you saw before. And you have particles in some regions like these ones, the particles uh, are not densely distributed. So this is low density region. You only use the original mesh. But in other regions where you have more particles, you can refine the cells to get a finer mesh. And if you have even higher density field, you use an even higher resolution mesh. So clearly, this will solve uh, the problem of um, the difficulty in balancing um, resolution and the computing resource, which is good. And of course, the drawback of this method is, is that it is uh, more complicated, and it is probably much more difficult and takes much longer than uh, how long it would take for you to write the PM code. And it's essentially, there are various uh, subtle things that you need to think about. For example, someone mentioned that there are interactions between the different uh, mesh levels. So, uh, for example, particle here will contribute to uh, density field at different levels. And another thing is that if you do this refinement, the shape of the refinement region is basically determined by the density distribution, underlying density distribution in the universe. So instead of a uniform, regular shaped uh, original mesh, now you have mesh, refinement mesh with irregular shapes like this one. And this is not very good for FFT. So I would argue that this is not a problem because we will not be using FFT anyway. We'll be using relaxation method. So this will not be a main restriction factor for us. And next I would go to the discussion of relaxation method. But before that, I want to mention that this is one critical drawback of AMR method, which uh, was already discussed this morning. And that is, um, uh, it is not very good at resolution. So it is true that you can uh, refine the cells to get finer and finer resolution in high density regions. But before you do the refinement, before the refinement is triggered, actually, uh, that region will suffer a lower than expected resolution. And that means that uh, uh, it will not be very good for small structures, like small halos, to form in those regions. And for that reason, if you compare uh, AMR simulations with uh, tree code simulations, like gadget simulations, you normally find that uh, uh, AMR simulations will give you uh, fewer small halos than the tree code. So this is not very good. And if you use AMR code, you need to bear this into mind. And probably you will need to make sure that refinement in your AMR simulations is very easy to be triggered so that you don't lose too much on small scale resolution. But for that, that will mean your code will be slower because you have more refinements, essentially. So now let me come to the relaxation method. So what it is, the relaxing method is basically an iterative method. In this method, you start from some initial guess. This is your guess. It may not be correct. It may be very terrible, but it's just a guess. So you start from this guess. You try to say if this guess is the true solution. Of course, it will not be. And then it will give you some guideline to update this guess. You update this guess uh, repeatedly 
until you finally get close enough to the true solution. So I'll give you one example. This is uh, an analogy to the standard Newton method that is used to solve nonlinear algebra equations, which I think many of us have used before. So here is a function f of x. You want to find the root of this function, which is uh, here, the blue dot. This is the true solution. This is the solution to fx equals 0. But we want now to numerically find this solution. We don't have a prior knowledge of this, so we make some initial guess. And that is this red point. So clearly, you can see that this is not the solution. Because if you put this value, x1, into fx, you find that it is not 0. So this is a bad guess. What you do is n next. OK, so you take the tangential curve, tangential line of this curve at x1. And then this tangential line crosses the x-axis at another point, x2. So then the next, next point, x2, will be your guess, ne next guess, updated guess. So there's a formula for this, which is basically x1, sorry, x2 equals x1 minus f at x1 divided by the first derivative of x of f at x1. And or more generally, you can write it uh, as x new x old instead of x2 x1. So now this is our update, updated guess, x2. But x2 clearly is still not a good uh, guess. So we'll do it again. We'll take the tangential curve at x2. And then now this, this tangential line crosses the x-axis at a new point x3. Now this x3 is much closer to the true solution, but it's still not yet there. So we do it again. And then we get this green point. And this green point is uh, very close, very, very close to the true solution. If you substitute the value of this new trial f x4 into fx, you will find that the right-hand side will be close to 0. So if this is close enough, if the value is smaller than some tolerate, toleration uh, threshold that you can accept, then you say, OK, uh, I'm satisfied. I, will find, I have found the true solution to uh, this function. So that is how the uh, Newton method works. As relaxation basically is uh, very similar to this in spirit. So what you have is you have this equation, which is a, a quite complicated equation. And you want to solve this value at cell number ijk, let's say this cell. And you know the density field in this cell. So you can rearrange this equation. You can define a new equation, uh, a new function, which is a function of phi ijk, so that the right hand side is 0. You want to find the correct value of phi ijk, so that the numerical value that you find here is close enough to 0. So that the, the idea is very similar to what you saw just now. The only difference being that uh, instead of finding a single value, now you are trying to find values of phi IGK in every cell. So for each cell, you want to find this, but uh, the function will depend on the values in nearby cells. So you have a coupled algebra equation. And this has n to the 3, or n cubic equations you want to solve simultaneously. So it's more complicated, but the idea is the same. So what you have is a very simple logic flow here. Um, you have some initial guess of phi ijk in each cell. For example, you can assume that phi ijk is 0 initially everywhere. Of course, this will not be the true answer. So if you substitute uh, the guess that phi ijk is 0 for all cells into your function f, we find that this f will not be close enough to 0. So what you do is that you follow the same logic as what you used in the Newton method just now. You update uh, the old solution to the new solution using the value of the function at the old solution and the derivative of the function at the old solution. So this is exactly the same. And then you go back, you, find, uh, you try to say if um, now, you are close enough to the true solution. If not, you go through this process again. 
and so on. So until that you find your, your guess is close enough to the true solution, then you, you're satisfied, you have found the solution. So that's the end of the relaxation procedure. So this is an iterative method that can take quite a few trials and errors. So one good thing about this is that if you look at this formula, it does not require the function f to be a linear function in phi. Actually, it can be linear and can be nonlinear. In this special case for the Poisson equation, it is linear because it only appears here. But in the non-standard gravity models, you often say that this will be nonlinear. However, you can still apply this formula. It doesn't make a difference. Just maybe there's a difference that non-standard models are slower, but the idea is the same. So we have talked about this uh, sentence quite a few times. Uh, we, we want to know whether this function is close enough to zero. And now we want to make a more precise definition of what we mean by this. Because this is a, as I said, this is a system of uh, functions with n cubic functions, where n being the number of cells along each direction. So for the special case of the Newton method you saw just now, you have only a single function. And it's easy to define uh, what you mean by the trial solution being close enough to the real solution. So basically, you, you have some predefined small number epsilon. If your trial solution gives you f of x trial less than epsilon, then you are satisfied that you have found the true solution. But for this, um, for the uh, relaxation method in solving differential equations, you have a system of equations. So what you do is that you can define uh, what people call residual. So this is basically some average of the function f in each cell. So basically you take the square of f in each cell, you sum them, and then you calculate the average, and then you calculate the square root. So this is, just, this is the uh, root mean square um, value of the function f on this mesh. And then you have some predefined epsilon. If this residual is small than, smaller than epsilon, then you can tell yourself that uh, uh, the relaxation method has converged and uh, I can stop. So this is how it works. However, you often find cases where uh, the residual will decays for a period of time and after a few iterations, it will not decay that fast. So probably if you set a epsilon which is too small, then uh, you will never get into the situation that the residue is smaller than that epsilon. So this is potentially a problem, but fortunately, that is not the only convergence criteria that you can use for relaxation methods. Actually, if you think about the whole process of using relaxation method to solve the Boisson equation, you find that you are actually solving a discrete version of a continuous equation. The Boisson equation itself is continuous, but you're solving a discretized version of it. And that discretization itself causes error. And that error is often called the truncation error. That is some error that you cannot control because if you do a discretization, it will be there. So for that reason, if your residue is smaller enough than the truncation error, then you can tell yourself, OK, so the residue is already small enough. And I can make it even smaller, but does it make sense? Is it, is it worth it? So that's, that's a good question, yes. Actually, we use, uh, quite, we use the same uh, criteria for the standard equations and non-standard equations. So we use some quite small value in most of our simulations. Like we use, uh, we require the residual to be smaller than 10 to the minus 8 in most cases to, to say that simulation uh, relaxation has converged. But actually, I think that is not necessary. Probably it's too conserved. 
Right, so these are the two uh, cri uh, convergence criteria that you can use to tell the code to stop relaxation iterations. And another thing that you need to bear in mind is that now you want to update the old value of phi in a cell to a new value. So you need to think of what is the order you want to use to update all these cells, because you have a mesh with n cubic cells, right? So, so you can update this first, next this, next this, next this, or you can update this one, this one, this one, uh, and then after you update all the red cells, you can start updating the white cell. So these different uh, orders of updating cells can give you slightly different performance of relaxation method. So what is most used is the so-called uh, black-red chessboard scheme, or in this case, it's wet-red chessboard. <laughs> so basically, you update all the red cells first, and then you update the, the, the wet ones, and then the red ones, and the wet ones again, until you get convergence. So, okay, so far it's so good. Uh, now we want to say what is the performance of the relaxation method. So we want to know if you do this relaxation iteration once, twice, three times, and so on, then how fast the residue decreases, because that is critical. If it decreases very slowly, then the method will be bad because you take a very long time to converge. So this is some examples. Um, uh, the solid lines are uh, the performance of three test cases, red, green, and blue. Uh, so the vertical axis is the residue, actually, it's the module of the residue, while the x-axis is the number of iterations. So unfortunately, you can say that, especially for this red case, the residue actually decays very, very slowly. It almost doesn't change even after a thousand iterations. So this is terrible because that means that it may take ages for your simulation to, to run. So that's actually one reason why this, is, this convergence is so slow. And that is given, uh, discussed here. So in most cases, you will find that uh, the residual decays fairly quickly in the first relaxation sweeps, but then it starts to decay s more and more slowly. The reason is that um, the relaxation method is very good at reducing your error to, to lead you uh, closer and closer to the true solution. But if you look at uh, for example here, if you update the value of potential in this cell, you will use the values in these nearby cells. So that means that there's a, you, can, you can think of this as a speed of information that uh, travels through the grid. So if you do one uh, iteration, then the information will affect the most nearby cells. And if you want to affect further and further cells, you need longer and longer time. And that is why um, it can take a long time for the code to converge. The point is that you can think of uh, the error of this. The error here means uh, how much you are away from the true solution. This is just a rough definition. The error, you can think of the error to be consist of different freer modes. You have long wave modes, you have short wave modes. And the short wave modes will be easy to deal with because uh, even with a few iterations, information could travel to cover the short wave mode so that uh, the error will decay. But the long wave mode, like the blue one, for example, you need many, many iterations to affect it, actually, to really affect it, because it covers a large distance and the information travels slowly. It, it travels one cell size every iteration. So this is precisely why um, the convergence can be slow in relaxation methods. So to solve this problem, actually, you can think of, you can use uh, different levels of mesh. So this, let's say this is the mesh on which you want to solve your Poisson equation. Now, you see that the mesh is very fine. So uh, that means that uh, errors in the Poisson equation will decrease on small scales, but on large scales, uh, the long wave modes will not decay fast. And now you can try to move this equation to a coarser grade instead of a finer grade. You have a coarser grade. This coarser grade has a large cell size, and that means that this will 
help to reduce longer wave mode of the error. And you can do this for even coarser grades, which will help to reduce the error for even longer mode, wave, wavelength mode. So this is what people call a multi-grade technical. And this this multi-grade uh, technical involves a hierarchy of coarser and coarser level of the uh, meshes. So this is different from AMR. I want to make this distinction because AMR basically says you want to have a hierarchy of higher, finer and finer meshes to get higher and higher resolution. But here, you want to have a hierarchy of coarser and coarser meshes to speed up your convergence of relaxation method. So what you do now with this multi-grid method is this. So you can first calculate, do the relaxation on this original fine mesh. And after you find uh, the residual starts to stuck, get stuck, then you cosify the equation, move the equation to the, cost, to the intermediate mesh and do relaxation there. And, and after several iterations, you further cosify the equation, and move the equation to the closest grade and do the relaxation there. And then you use the information you have got from these two levels to update or correct the solution on the final level. So you go back to the final level. And then you check whether uh, the relaxation method has converged. If not, you do this again. And you can do this many times. So this is, the shape is a V shape. So this is what people call V cycle. And there are different ways to arrange this, uh, this multi-grade method. So you can, uh, do a relaxation here, instead of going back to the final level, now you can do cosify the equation again, go to the uh, cost, costest level and do the relaxation there and, and then go back to the original final level. So this is a W cycle. These are just, just different arrangements. So they can give you slightly different performance in terms of convergence rate. And uh, if you are not sure, you can check, you can try different methods to say which works best. So this is the same plot you saw just now, but now instead of a single grade, which gives you this convergence rate for the three different test cases, we're using a multi-grade technical. And uh, the convergence rate is here uh, showing in these dotted lines for the same colors, for the same uh, three uh, test cases. You can see that if you use multi-grade, you really speed up the convergence a lot. And this can help you to uh, make your simulation more efficient. For that reason, multi-grade method is, uh, is a standard technical that is used in relaxing method nowadays. Okay, another thing that we, have, we haven't covered is the boundary conditions. If you have a partial differential equation, uh, which is of elliptical type, which means that you only have um, spatial derivatives and not time derivatives, We'll talk about time derivatives later. Um, then, clearly, to solve this partial differential equation or to have a unique solution, you need to give the system some boundary condition. And uh, the question now is, uh, how do you set this boundary condition? For AMR simulations, there are two types of boundary conditions. The first type is the boundary condition at the edge of the simulation box. So you have a box, the mesh has a finite size, and there's a boundary you need to have a boundary condition at the boundary. The second type of boundary conditions is um, the, the boundary condition at the AMR refinement edge. So you have refinements, and these refinements have irregularly shaped configurations. At the edges of these configurations, you need boundary conditions. So the first type of boundary conditions is a, in most cosmological simulations, People use periodic boundary condition. I mean, I'm saying most, not all. So what is this, a periodic boundary condition? It means that if a particle, for example, moves in the x direction and moves out of this mesh, then at the same time, it will move into the same mesh from the other direction. So this is what we mean by boundary condition. And if you have a boundary condition, you can consider this red particle and this red particle as nearby na neighbors, even though they look quite far away from, from this plot. Because I mean, if this particle moves a little bit, it will go to here. 
Uh, similarly, if you look at this red cell, you want to find its neighbors. They are highlighted in purple. So some of the neighbors will be in this corner, in this corner, and some are in this corner. And the second type of boundary conditions is uh, the, the boundary condition at the edges of the refinement. So what you do here is that you fix the value of the potential in the boundary cells. And these values are given by interpolating from the coarser level, from the lower level. And in EMR simulations, uh, you always solve the cost level first, and then the fine level, and then the final level. So for that reason, when you are solving the equation on the fine level, you already know the solution on the cost level. So you can use that solution to fix the boundary condition at the fine level, and then you do the relaxation. That will make sure that uh, uh, your potential field will be continuous if you go across different levels, and that is highly important. So here, I'm just uh, trying to wrap up what I talked today. Um, I want to use the same logic plot for uh, PM code. But now I want to add more details because I'm trying to use this for the AMR technical. So I start from the particle initial condition. I would first get the density field by doing some density assignments. Uh, the difference from the PM method is that now I need to take care of this at different levels. So I start from the closest level, and, and then I calculate the density in each cell. And then I find some cells really have high densities, so they need to be split into sun cells. So I do the refinement, I get this next level. And, and similarly, I do this until I'm already at the finest level. So in this way, you can get a hierarchy of meshes, always some density field. Um, yeah, so one thing that you want to be careful about is um, uh, particles that are at the boundary of refinement, so such as this one, these ones, the red ones. So these particles, they will contribute. Remember, if you have a cloud in cell method, this particle will contribute to uh, the mass in four cells, in this one, this one, this one. These are fine cells, but the, it also contributes to the mass in this cost cell. So you need to uh, try to modify your density assignment scheme a little bit to make sure that the uh, correct amount of mass of the particle is distributed in these different cells, because otherwise you won't get mass conservation. And after doing that, you have a density field at different hierarchies of matches. You can solve uh, the potential field on these matches. You solve the potential field on the closest match first. And after doing that, you can set the boundary condition on the first level of refinement. And then you use the relaxation method to solve phi on the first refinement. And then you get boundary condition for the next refinement. And you do this again and again until you solve the potential for all levels. And once you have done that, you can do the force calculation, which is basically taking the spatial derivative of the potential field on the meshes. Um, you can do this as what you do for PM code, and again, you need to take care at the boundaries of the refinements because, uh, for example, if you want to calculate the force upon this particle, you need to know the potential in this cell and the potential in this big cell, cost cell. So you need to modify uh, the finite difference formula that you use for PM code to take account of the fact that this is a cost cell while this is a fine cell. And um, for time integration, particle movement, you can still use the leapfrog time stepping scheme. And the only caveat is that now you have different levels. And the higher refinement levels have smaller cell size. And you don't want your particle to move to cross many s small cells in one time step. So what you do is that you can, uh, for higher levels, you can have smaller time steps so that particles will not move uh, across too many cells. 
normally you don't want the particle to move across one cell size on every level. So that means that on finite levels, you will have a smaller time step and so on. So this is what people call subcycling. And finally, you do <coughs> this repeatedly. This is what you saw for the PM method. So after you do this particle movement for all levels, you get the new density field, you calculate density field, potential force, particle movement, and so on, until you reach uh, the redshift you want your simulation to stop at. And, and then you can analyze uh, your simulation data. So I think I'm quite fast to finish. And uh, this is a, a short summary of the PM method and the AM met AMR method uh, that is used for embodied simulations. And tomorrow in, in the lecture, I will talk about how you can use this method to non-standard models, to solve the non-linear equations in those models. Um, the basic logic is very close to here. As you have seen, the relaxation method, the formula to update from the old solution to the new solution really does not assume linearity of the equation. So in terms of application to non-standard models, the same logic basically applies, but there are some subtleties which I'll discuss tomorrow, and I'll then talk about uh, other methods to more efficiently uh, simulate non-standard models or do uh, studies without simulations. And then in the final lecture, I'll talk about how you can make connections from simulations to observations and I will review some of the recent constraints on non-standard models. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a few short questions for Baojin. Okay, in the boundary conditions, if you have a particle moving in the, in the X, X, yeah, on X, so, if it goes to the end of the cell, of the grid, it mm -hmm. appears to the other side, right? Yes. Mm, and, well, if you take the grid and you close it like this. Yeah, imagine yes. you take it, you have it like this, and you close it, right? Yes. So this particle is going to appear just uh, in the other side. That's right. But we are not considering forces, the, the potential of this cell, the, ex the s extreme cell of the right, it's not considered on the other cell, on the other extreme. But so, what, what do you yeah. mean? So, yeah, no, the, it's, so if you calculate, if you, uh, sorry, if you calculate the density field in this cell, then it will receive contribution from these particles and from particles in nearby cells, but also from particles in these cells. Okay. So for that reason, the Poisson equation will already take care of these uh, boundary conditions. Okay. 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 Thanks. So in the multi-grid technique, um, just to see if I got it right. Uh, when when you go down, when you coarsify, you calculate the the potential, and then the the update of the forces and the and the positions are done once you've done all the relaxation periods, right? Yeah. In the all in the finer grid, in the first grid, yeah. they're done there. That you don't do them in the mid levels don't you no you do it you do it on every level you do it also in this level uh, you, in this you level as well you update the the positions and velocities of the particles in those levels as well no 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 you don't do you don't calculate potential in okay. this okay that's that's what i was asking yeah, so you, you calculate uh, the potentials and then when once you go back to the finer grid you yeah. do the update of the positions yeah. and velocities you calculate uh, potential or you calculate you do the relaxation for a maybe a slightly different equation from the original equation on this level and this level. Mm -hmm. And they use this information only to update the solution on the final level. So you don't okay. calculate the force yeah. on these particles okay. because there are no particles on these mm -hmm. levels. Yeah, that was the question. Sorry. These are virtual levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
Okay, if no further questions, we will keep them for the evening project discussion. Thank you, Bao Ying, again. And we'll be back at 15.30. So, we'll see you again in the evening. Ser en veterinaria, yo creo que ahí pueden pagar los que no están becados, que está más cerca. De...